With the clearer weather, the way seemed open for Napoleon to launch an immediate attack on the Allies, spearheaded by his most feared tactic. The classic Napoleonic ploy for a battle is always to begin with an artillery bombardment. French artillery was very good. Uh, they were good guns, effective guns, and there were plenty of them. Napoleon's beloved artillery was the most feared in the world, and its immense firepower was more than sufficient to blast Wellington's troops from their positions on the ridge. But even though the rain had stopped by morning, it had left a big problem for Napoleon. When you're in the, uh, the hollows around here, you've got really sticky, claggy mud. The problem is you've got uh, a, a geology around here that's um, silty uh, loams. And they, when they get wet, they get very wet and very slippery. I cannot get my shoe out of the mud, and that must have been exactly what it was like. But the, the, uh, the mud itself, if you look at it carefully, it's incredibly fine. But when it's wet like this, uh, these fine particles clag together and uh, it just becomes like putty. Had the battle been fought only 30 to 40 miles to the southwest, we'd have had a very different situation. Nice chalky downs which would have drained very quickly indeed. But this is just the wrong area to, to fight in when it's been raining. But why should mud be more of a problem for Napoleon than for Wellington? On the morning of the 18th of June, 1815, this gun was part of Napoleon's ground battery. Now, this is about as good as it gets. This gun was manufactured in 1813. It's a 12-pounder, and this should have given an artillery general like Napoleon a decided advantage. But it's very heavy. This is going to take, in ideal conditions, about eight men to move it. That's when the ground is baked hard. But on the morning of the 18th of June, of course, the ground was, was like a quagmire. Napoleon knew the sodden ground would make it difficult to maneuver his big guns, and he was gripped by a terrible dilemma. Knowing every minute's delay could be potentially disastrous, he decided to wait several tense hours for the ground to dry out. But with the Prussians closing in, was this a wise decision? What would have happened if Napoleon had pushed on through the mud regardless? By waterlogging and plowing up an area of terrain, a team from the Royal Artillery simulate conditions on the Waterloo battlefield. They aim to investigate just how difficult it would have been for Napoleon's gun crews if he'd sent them into action without waiting for the ground to dry out. Stand by! Go! Come on there! Moving the heavy 12-pounders forward into position would have been just the start for Napoleon's gunners. After every shot, the half-ton guns would have had to be run back through the mud, the massive recoil having blown them yards back out of position. In the opening bombardment at Waterloo, the crews would have had to sustain this workload for an hour or more, each gun firing more than a hundred rounds. The Royal Artillery team gets a taste of the fatigue caused by manning a 12-pounder at Waterloo in a point-to-point -point relay for just 10 minutes a fraction of the time the French crews were in action. Stop! Steve Myers is a sports physiologist. By monitoring the soldiers' heart rates and blood lactate levels, he's able to measure the level of fatigue they experience. It was a very good test. I mean, they worked incredibly hard. During strenuous exercise, lactic acid gradually builds up until muscles tire and seize. The lactate levels here are like maximum lactate levels. Really, you get off, so it's a sort of test to exhaustion on a treadmill, these kind of levels you expect to see. The soldiers' heart rates, too, are close to the maximum, around 180 beats per minute. The heart rates we've got up here, interestingly, what it shows is they're all, you know, close to maximal heart rates there. They're sort of aerobic fat-burning type exercise range. We saw our well-trained British gunners doing this, and they were really tired at the end of it. If you take the French artillerymen firing those guns, there's no chance that they wouldn't have been, you know, they wouldn't have been affected by fatigue. They would have been very, very tired, and they wouldn't have been able to maintain the sort of rates of fire. With dozens of exhausted crews repeating this process alongside each other, the firing of the Grand Battery would have become sparser and the gun line itself steadily more disorganized. 
It's clear Napoleon made the right decision in delaying his attack. If he'd pressed on, his prized artillery could have collapsed. But he must still have been confident of the overwhelming firepower of his heavy guns, his beautiful daughters, massed together in one grand battery, ready to smash the Allied line. Finally, around midday, the French guns opened fire. The great bombardment opens up classic Napoleonic start to a battle. Um, lots of fuss and feathers, lots of noise, lots of smoke, very little effect. Despite its huge firepower, the Grand Battery was still not as effective as it should have been. Something else was going wrong. Wellington's troops were sheltered by the reverse slope. But as well as solid cannonballs, the French were also using explosive shells, fired over the ridge crest to fall down, bursting amongst the Allied soldiers. Shell fire should have been devastating, so why at Waterloo did it have so little impact? Major Simon West is an expert on the artillery weapons used at Waterloo. He's been trying to find out why the French shell fire was so ineffective. To be sure his experiments are accurate, Simon has had hollow iron shells made, exactly like those used by the French at Waterloo. Shells were designed to burst apart, sending heavy, lethal fragments in all directions. In normal conditions, this would inflict heavy casualties, but at Waterloo, the conditions were anything but normal. On Salisbury Plain, he simulates the ground conditions at Waterloo. Simon buries a six-inch shell containing nearly two pounds of gunpowder, only feet away from a target representing a line of Allied soldiers. Three, two, one, fire. Well, this is brilliant because it was buried just below the surface, as it might have landed if it was coming in at a decent angle and buried a bit. The energy of the explosion has been absorbed by the ground and had no effect on the target, only feet away. Amazingly, the target has escaped virtually unscathed. Although his guns pounded on, it's clear the wet ground severely reduced the effectiveness of Napoleon's grand battery. Wellington's troops had only to sit out the heavy bombardments behind the sheltering ridge. They knew that eventually the French infantry would be forced to attack across the muddy valley and up the hill. The densely packed French columns would make ideal targets for the Allied cannonballs and shells. And the Allies had another weapon, one that was not affected by the weather, the most feared of all artillery weapons. Canister. It's 1 p.m. Napoleon's artillery has failed, thanks to the wet ground and Wellington's use of the sheltering terrain. But with the Prussians now close by, Napoleon dare not delay. He launches his heavy infantry attack. Advancing steadily across the muddy, exposed valley, the French soldiers have no cover. They're easy targets for Wellington's Allied artillery, above them on the ridge. The French soldiers struggle into a storm of lethal, close-quarters artillery fire. Using an original Waterloo British cannon that has not been fired in more than a century, Major Simon West investigates just how effective the Allied cannonballs would have been on Napoleon's densely packed troops. He'll load it with a six-pound solid iron round shot, exactly what the Allied gunners would have used against the ranks of French soldiers, represented by the target 
a hundred yards away. Okay, the right first shot in 150 years. Stand by. Three, two, one, back. At over 200 meters per second, the round shot is devastating. The solid iron balls would have plowed through the packed French ranks, a single shot killing or wounding as many as 10 or 15 men. Now, seeing the shot fired out of the cannon there, you think of that six pound shot having so much energy, there's no doubt that it, if that engaged a sort of rows of cavalry or infantry in column, it would reap horrendous havoc. But destructive as round shot could be, when the surviving French infantry closed in to point-blank range, the Allied gunners switched to the most feared artillery device of all, canister. What I'm going to do is make up um, some canister charge. Canister was literally musket balls inside uh, a thin-walled metal tube. Simon wants to find out just why this anti-personnel device was the terror weapon of the Napoleonic Wars. The metal tube burst apart as it exited the cannon's muzzle, creating a huge shotgun effect. Fire. Well, considering that that frontage represents probably six men in file, not one of them has escaped injury. And bearing in mind that each of those balls is travelling at over 100 metres per second, even out at this range, uh, that's going to represent a fatal injury.